may be seated. Who are you following? Everybody is following somebody or something. Put another way, everyone is a disciple. The question isn't, are you a disciple? It's who or what are you a disciple of? 2,000 years ago, a Hebrew rabbi by the name of Jesus made this invitation, come and follow me. He invited anyone, everyone, to become his disciples or students in living. Over the last 2,000 years, millions of people have said yes to Jesus' invitation. It's changed not only their lives, but the course of human history. And it can do the same for you. Let's pray. Oh God, we, we acknowledge how much we need you. Thinking back to the very first beatitude that we talked about last week, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who acknowledge, recognize their desperate need for you. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And we, we begin this time together with that, that acknowledgement that you are our righteousness. You are our strength. God, we need your grace. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Wherever we're at today, whatever we carry with us into this place or as we're watching online, wherever we are, meet us where we are. And Lord, I pray that you would shepherd our hearts today, that you would speak to us personally, and that you would speak to us together as your community, your people. So may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, and all of God's people said, amen. Well, we are continuing with our fall sermon series on Jesus' famous Sermon on the Mount, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5 through 7. Uh, I've invited you to, to be reading uh, the, the larger Gospel of Matthew between now and Thanksgiving in between Sundays, but we're really going to focus in on Jesus' teaching on the kingdom through the Sermon on the Mount when we gather for worship like this. And one of the things that I've been saying as we kind of move into this series is that the Sermon on the Mount, I believe, gives us arguably the clearest and most compelling picture of what it looks like for us to live all of life under the reign of God, under the rule of God. In other words, it gives us one of the clearest and most compelling pictures of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. That, that really is what our focus is on in this series. What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, to be one of Jesus' students, his apprentices, that's the word that we're using. And, and we've talked about it this way, that to be an apprentice of Jesus, if you could put that up there for me, is learning to be with Jesus, it's about becoming like Jesus, and doing life as Jesus did, living as Jesus did, as, as Jesus does as he lives in us now. That we wanna arrange our, our, our lives around these three primary goals that we've taken from John Mark Comer's book, Practicing the Way, being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and doing as he did. This is what it means to have the heart and the character of a disciple. So we started last Sunday with the Beatitudes, the opening part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, and we talked about how the Beatitudes provide us with a vision for the good life, a life of blessing, and that we see that it is upside down compared to the pervasive assumptions and values of our world. Now, today, we're gonna jump over the next part in the sermon where Jesus talks about this metaphor of being the salt of the earth and the light of the world, and we're going to come back to that in a couple weeks. And here's why we're jumping over it, because two weeks from now, uh, Pastor John Opkenorth, who was my predecessor here at Trinity, is going to be with us. And Titus Baraka, uh, our mission partner from Uganda, is going to be on the Hospers campus. And I wanted them to fit into the sermon series. And so they said they would if they could preach on the passage about being salt and light. 
And I'm not going to tell John Opkinorth no. I mean, some of you know how that goes. So I said, okay, that's, that's great. Um, what we'll do is we'll just jump ahead, and then, and then we'll come back. So we're going to skip ahead to Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And Michelle Christie is going to come forward and read this for us now. So ch Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. And the, the, the words for the NRSV will be on the screen behind you, but if you brought your own Bible, I would encourage you to open it up and you can follow along with your translation. So hear these words, Christ's words, from the book that we love. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come not to abolish, but to fulfill. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you'll be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So, when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're on the way to court with him or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, to, be God. to God. Thank you, Michelle. I want to begin with a question this morning. How many of you are fans of murder mysteries? Raise your hand. Raise your hand high so I can see them. Oh, there's a lot more in this, in this group than the last service. Um, my wife and I absolutely love murder mysteries. Uh, whether it is a whodunit, page turner by a master storyteller like Agatha Christie, or a keep you on the edge of your seat movie with all kinds of plot twists and turns that keep you guessing to the end, um, we, we just love the suspense and the surprise. Now, one of our favorite movies is a 1976 classic film, so that's a long time ago, uh, titled Murder by Death. Has anybody seen this movie, Murder by Death? Anyone? Um, oh, one. Rick, you've seen it? You're the only person. So uh, it's a really, it's a great film. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Who else? Oh, oh okay. I'm sorry. Is that, a, you, is that Olivia? Oh, Olivia. You weren't even born then, Olivia. That's... Um, <laughs> So, so 1976 film, Murder by Death, um, and it's, it's a spoof. It's, it's a spoof on the murder mystery genre, but the title is kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> murder by Death? Like, shouldn't it be Death by Murder? I mean, is there any other way to murder somebody than by death, than by killing them? Well, as a matter of fact, Jesus would say to us, there is, that Spilling someone's blood is not the only way to murder someone. This part of the Sermon on the Mount, I really want to focus on the latter part that Michelle read today, um, is focusing on murder. And Jesus has some plot twists of his own here. Here's what he writes. Here's what he says. You have heard that it was said to those in ancient times, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. Now, Jesus is referring to the Sixth Commandment. So the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue in the Old Testament, when God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai, the Sixth Commandment, you shall not murder, the Jewish community in Jesus' day would have had those memorized. I mean, they, they knew the Sixth Commandment. 
And the scribes and the Pharisees, who were the ones who were the experts in the law, and their job was to help the community know how to interpret it. Like, what does it look like to live this out? The primary way that they would have interpreted the command to, uh, to not murder would have been, uh, they, they would have thought of it more literally in terms of the act of homicide. So whether it was a premeditated act or you know, murder in the moment, a brash reaction, it didn't matter, that was murder. It was this out, outward act of, of taking another person's life. Jesus pushes the sixth commandment deeper and further. Here's the plot twist. More than a literal act of homicide, Jesus tells us that do not murder, that the heart of it, and I literally mean that, the heart of it, is about what is going on in one's feelings and thoughts how one uses their words and their deeds even beyond the act of murder itself. Here's what he says. But I say to you, I say to you, that if you are angry with a brother or sister, that you will be liable to judgment. Now here's something remarkable that's happening. And this is going to be happening throughout the entire Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is claiming the authority. He's got the chutzpah to think that he can deepen and give the right interpretation of the law or the Torah. I mean, this is one of the things that upset the Pharisees and the scribes. They're like, who does this guy think he is? What authority does he think he has? That he's the one who can tell us how to interpret this and live it out. And yet Jesus is the one who has this authority. Jesus wants to push this notion of righteousness beyond the externals. For the Pharisees, so much of their righteousness, so much of their um, right behavior was about external behavior, and um, it, 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 was, it was about kind of this skin-deep sort of righteousness. And what Jesus is going to be doing in the Sermon on the Mount is he's like pushing it beyond that, saying it's not just about external behavior. God cares about what goes on in the deep places of the heart. And of course, we need to be reminded, um, remember the, 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 the first beatitude that I, I mentioned last week, that we need to keep going back to that one about blessed are the poor in spirit, because everything Jesus calls us to in the Sermon on the Mount, especially the hard stuff like today, we, do not, we don't do it in our own righteousness. Uh, we're utterly dependent upon God's grace. Jesus would be clear, even later in the gospel, that we only come into the kingdom because of his righteousness, so when he's saying to us that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, what he's saying is that, you know, it's got to be, it, you, you can't do this on your own. And the kind of transformation that God wants in your life has to be this deep inside-out transformation, right? Let's get into the deep place of the heart. So murder isn't just the act of killing someone Jesus is saying, in effect, even if you don't have murder on your hands, you can have murder in your heart. Even if you don't have it on your hands, you can have it in your heart. How? Well, you can have it in your heart when you were angry with a brother or sister. Friends, this is a case of not murder by death, but murder by anger. Now, wait a minute, time out. <laughs> Is Jesus saying that we shouldn't ever be angry? Can we just talk about this for a second? Is Jesus saying that anger in and of itself is bad? I mean, doesn't the Bible talk about, like, on numerous occasions where God is angry, angry at, uh, at times because of the disobedience of his people? Doesn't the Bible talk about God's wrath uh, in the face of sin and evil and injustice? I mean, didn't Jesus himself get angry? Do you remember that time in the temple with the money changers? how he got angry and he flipped the tables over. And I'm pretty sure somewhere Paul says something like there is such a thing as righteous anger. All of that is true. Let's just be clear. Jesus is not saying don't ever be angry. I grew up in a home where anger was a bad emotion. Uh, it, it was, we, we, were, we weren't allowed to really be angry. You could be sad and frustrated and discouraged, but anger was seen as, as, as more of a negative thing. Let me just say, if, if you grew up in a home like that too, anger is part of the way that, that's one of the emotions that comes with the human experience. And as we're gonna see, the issue is not with anger in and of itself, but it's what we do with our anger and maybe getting beneath the surface to ask her the question, and why are we angry? Barbara Brown Taylor, one of my favorite preachers, 
she's helpful on this. Here's a sermon that I came across where she talks about this. She says, all by itself, anger is not that damaging. It is not much more than a quick rush of adrenaline that you feel when you are being threatened, or at least you perceive that you're being threatened. It tells you something that you hold dear is in danger. Your property, your beliefs, your physical safety. I think of anger as a kind of flashing yellow light that says, caution, something is going on here. Slow down and see if you can figure out what it is. Almost like the light that comes on in your car that says, check engine, check engine. Something is going on. Let's figure out what's going on. She goes on to write, when I slow down, I can usually learn something from my anger. And if I am lucky, I can use the energy of it to push for change in myself or my relationships with others. Often I can see my own part in what I'm angry about. And that helps because if I had a hand in it, then I can concentrate on getting my hand out of it instead of spinning my wheels in blame. I can, in other words, figure out what my anger has to teach me and then let it go. In other words, figure out, uh, or what my, and then let it go, but when my anger goes on and on without my learning or changing anything, then it is not plain anger anymore. It has become bitterness instead. It has become resentment, which a friend of mine calls arthritis of the spirit. I love that. Arthritis of the spirit. So the Greek word that Jesus uses for anger here, and there's multiple words that can be used, is really important. Here it is. Go ahead and put it up on the screen for me, Caleb. Orgizam, uh, orgizamenes, is the word that he, that he uses here. And Jesus is, it's carefully, he's carefully using this word because what this word means, literally it's carrying anger or remaining angry or nursing a grudge. The kind of anger, Jesus is not saying don't ever be angry. He, what he's saying is be very careful that you are not holding on to your anger. That you're not nursing uh, a, a grudge, that you're not um, continuing to kind of revisit and revisit that anger and let it take over you. I mean, again, that phrase arthritis of the spirit is so, it's so good because I think that that's what resentment and bitterness does. It, it inflames the joints of one's spirit. It eats away at the soul. It's a kind of cancer of the soul. And Jesus says this kind of anger, bitterness and resentment, it may not lead to the ultimate act of murder, but it is tantamount to murder in God's perspective, from God's perspective. It's just as bad. Not only can it injure other people, but Jesus says it kills your own heart. And it rips apart relationships. Re uh, resentment and bitterness can cause us to think and feel things towards others that are not honoring to God. It causes us to think and say and do things that are not in the character of Christ. But Jesus goes further than just talking about our feelings of anger or bitterness and resentment. He, he also extends this teaching to the words that we speak. Here's what he says. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, you fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. Again, let's look a little bit at some of the Greek in this passage. The word translated as insult here is the equivalent of the Aramaic word raka. In fact, some of your uh, translations will put the word raka right in there. And raka is not a common term for us today, but it was a very derogatory term in the first century. Um, it, it means literally empty-headed. And raka, was a, it was, a, it was a, a, um, a highly offensive way to insult someone's intelligence. The Greek word that gets translated as you fool comes from more, from which we get the English word moron, and more has to do with insulting a person's character. So raka expresses contempt for a person's head. It'd be like saying you stupid and probably worse. And more expresses contempt for a person's heart, saying you scoundrel, you're rotten to the core. Jesus' point is clear. 
When you use your words to insult and injure others, to attack them, to attack their intelligence, to attack their character, Jesus says this is murder in the first degree, that our words matter. You you maybe remember the nursery rhyme, right? Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. And we all know that that's false. We all know that that's false. Some of you especially know how painful words can be. Words can abuse and bully and discourage and beat up and push down. Words, words can kill. And Jesus says that you and I, we are liable to judgment when resentment is in our heart and insult is on our lips or more fitting for this context, this cultural context, or when insult is in your social media feed on your Facebook and Instagram posts, in the words that you tweet. Resentment and insult are so dangerous and so serious that Jesus says to us, they must be dealt with right away. The Apostle Paul would say, don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let it go down on your anger because then you will give the enemy, the devil, a foothold. Don't let it become arthritis of the spirit. Don't let it crystallize into bitterness. So here's a question for you this morning. Practically, what what should we do with our anger? What should we do with our anger? If we don't want it to become bitterness and resentment, are there other options? And the answer to that is there are. And let me just kind of make a turn now. And for the rest of the sermon and the time that we have, I want to give you three practical practices Three practical things that you can do with your anger. The first two um, are not explicit in the passage, but but they resonate with the truth of Scripture. The last one is explicit in the passage today. But here they are. What do you do with your anger? Um, First of all, practice lament. I found that this is one of the most important things to do when I feel angry. We don't need to deny our anger. We don't need to push it down or bottle it up. That never works anyway. It always comes out sideways or comes out in an explosive way that is unhealthy for you and others around you. The healthiest thing that we can do with our anger and our frustration and our disappointment is to bring that to God. God invites us to do do so. Express your feelings of anger. And, And in all the raw emotion of it, bring it to God. You may even be angry at God, and that's okay. Just read some of the Psalms of lament. God is big enough to take it. This is one of the healthiest things that we can do with our anger. The first move is to bring it to God. When I find myself practicing lament, here's another thing that it does for me. Not only does it give me a a healthy way to express it, but it also gives me the opportunity to process my anger in the presence of God. To get beneath the surface and to get curious about what am I really angry about? And why am I so angry? Anger is often a cover-up emotion. I think this is true especially for men. I think it's true for men and women, but I see it as a pastor often with men. When I mean that it's a cover-up emotion, for a lot of us, we'll allow ourselves to feel anger, uh, especially guys, because it, it can feel strong. But we gotta pop the hood and see what's beneath it because often there are other emotions that are beneath the anger that we're not aware of. Things like sadness or shame or fear or insecurity. Lament gives us the opportunity in the presence of God to say, Lord, help me see what's really going on Help me see what's really going on. What am I really angry about? What is this tapping into deep in in me right now? And maybe it's something that needs to be healed that I need to, to hold up in your presence. It also, when I practice lament, not only does it help me work through my feelings and process them in the presence of God, but it gives me an opportunity to think about what's a healthy way now for me to move towards others. Rather than just sweep it under the rug, Lord, is there somebody I need to move towards and have a, a conversation with? Somebody that I need to share about the impact of what they said or did. Is there a way for me to think about healing that can happen, but it's going to require being honest and being able to talk about what happened? So that's the first practice, is lament. Where do you go with your anger? Again, don't push it down. Don't try to bottle it up. Bring it before the Lord and ask God to help you process it 
and, and to be able to kind of more deeply understand what's going on beneath it. Here's the second thing, and that is to choose forgiveness. And this is hard. I'm just gonna name it, especially if you've been hurt by somebody um, or deeply hurt by somebody, and yet the Bible is clear that the only antidote to bitterness and resentment is the path of forgiveness. Now there's a lot of things that we could say about forgiveness. Jesus is gonna make this explicit soon enough in the Sermon on the Mount when he gets to the Lord's Prayer. In in another chapter, he's gonna talk about we're called to forgive as the Lord has forgiven us. Forgiveness does not mean that it's okay what a person did to you. Forgiveness does not mean that there shouldn't be accountability for a person's behavior. Can I just say that as clearly as I can? And forgiveness is often not something that just happens kind of as a one and done deal, an instant thing. I've come to see that forgiveness is a process. Um, Tim Keller once said something so helpful to me about forgiveness. He said, it's important that we don't wait until we feel like forgiving a person before we take a step uh, in in the process of forgiving. He said, it's important that we choose to forgive, to choose to take a step, choose to kind of get on that path of forgiveness knowing that as we forgive, and it may, it may take you seven times, 77 times to fully forgive somebody, but as you choose to forgive, then by the grace of God, you will begin to feel as if you've forgiven somebody. Often our grudges can feel so good. Often our resentments can feel so good. We like the feeling of being righteous or being in the right and the other person being in the wrong. I remember talking to a man a couple years ago who, was, who said to me he was angry with a group of people in the church and he said, he said Brian, my, inner, my anger gives me energy and it makes me feel so strong. And my heart broke for him because what he couldn't see and what everybody else could see was the way that that anger had put him in prison and was ruining him. One of my favorite scenes from a book uh, comes from the book, The Rapture of Canaan, which is a novel by Sherry Reynolds. And whenever I think about anger and bitterness, I think about this story. And I've shared this before in other sermons, but it it just, for me, it it, it moves me every time. And in this book, The Rapture of Canaan, uh, there's a young lady named Nina that somebody has hurt her deeply. And she is just stewing with bitterness and resentment. It's consuming her. And her wise grandmother says to her these words. She says, Nina, there's only so much room in one heart. You can fill it up with love, or you can fill it up with resentment. But every bit of resentment that you hold takes space away from love. And the resentment don't do no good, no way. But look what love can do. There's only so much room in your heart, friends. And you can fill it up with resentment. You can fill it up with bitterness. But every bit of resentment that you hold on to takes space away from love. Every bit of it. And how's that working for you? But think about what love can do. Look what it has done in the person of Jesus who comes and takes on our own sin and brokenness and offers us forgiveness in his death and resurrection. Jesus insists that as disciples of Jesus, we want to make space for love, love of God, love of our neighbor, and he expresses the urgency then for us to do something with the resentment that we feel, to do something with it right away, and that leads to the third thing that I wanna just offer you this morning. So the first thing, what do we do with our anger? We lament. The second thing um, is that we choose forgiveness, and again, remember that takes time, that's a journey. But the third thing, and this is the explicit thing that Jesus says, is that we're called to take the initiative to seek reconciliation. He says it plainly. So when you are offering your gift at the altar, and if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, Jesus says, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Let me put it in contemporary language. If you are in church, Jesus says, in the middle of worship, like we are now, 
and you suddenly remember that your brother or sister has a grievance against you, stop what you are doing. Do not wait. Go find that person. Ask for forgiveness. Be reconciled first to your brother or sister, and then come back and continue your worship in the presence of God. Not only does Jesus call us to do this with brothers and sisters within the family of God, but he calls it, uh, us to have this kind of urgency with reconciliation with those outside the church. He says, come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Jesus' point is the same in both of these cases. If somebody has something against you or you have something against them, if there is a fracture, if there is a, a breakdown in the relationship, then deal with it right away. Don't delay, not only for your sake, not only for the sake of the relationship, not only for the sake of the community, but Jesus would say for the sake of our witness as the church. Because if the world looks at the church and sees fighting and division and resentment, and hostility within us, instead of love, peace, unity, holiness, forgiveness, then Jesus would say we lose our saltiness, that that's like putting the bushel basket over the light, and we lose the impact of our witness. Let me close with this today. Come with me to a room full of about 80 women Michelle in Mukono, in Mukono, is it where we were at? Re different place. A room full of women in Mukono, Uganda. That's not them, but it, it's close to a visual that I wanted to give you. It's 12, it's 12 years ago, 2012. So come with me back then, and it's, it's a hot and humid day. It's all the hotter with all of these bodies crammed into this pastor's spouse conference. And a team from Trinity is, is here, and they're investing in our mission partner with Titus and Mary Baraka. And on this trip, Michelle and Rachel Fernstrom are both there. Michelle Christie is speaking. She's not speaking, she's preaching. And this is her last of a six or seven talks that she is that she's been giving at this conference. And here she is, and she's preaching on the story from the Gospel of Luke. Maybe you remember this story of the unseemly woman who barges into the house of the religious leaders where Jesus is meeting with them, and she falls at Jesus' feet, and they condemn her. Instead, Jesus, though, shows her love and forgiveness. It's the upside-down way of God's kingdom. Michelle is preaching, and she calls the women present to receive God's forgiveness in their own lives, but then she pushes it a step further. And she says to the, the women, she says that if any of you has a grudge against anyone else, now is the time to also forgive each other. She finishes her sermon, Titus gets up, says a few more closing remarks, and then something remarkable happens. Something gospel happens. Something of the kingdom happens in this moment. One woman slowly stands up and comes forward, comes to the front, she looks out over the group, and she points to another woman all the way in the corner of the room, and she says in front of everybody, I need to confess that I have harbored hatred in my heart towards this woman for many, many years. Can you imagine like that happening in worship for us? Suddenly her face relaxes and her eyes fill with compassion. Tears begin to stream down her cheeks and then she says, sister, I want you to know that I am sorry. I forgive you. Will you please forgive me? And in that room, there was a rushing wind, a gale force like Pentecost, blowing through the room, and another woman stands up, and then another, and then another, and then another, and they're like dandelions popping up all over the place. Many of them are falling to their knees, weeping aloud, one person after another, publicly confessing their resentment towards their sisters, 
asking for forgiveness, offering forgiveness, and there's tears, and there's embracing, and there's laughter, and there's songs of praise, and there's joyful dancing, and there's dead hearts coming alive again. The upside down kingdom of God. Can I just speak to your heart today? Like there are, this sermon is for all of us, but there are some of us that this sermon is, is, is especially for us today. There is only so much room in your heart. What's in it today? Would you have the courage to look at your own heart? And what are you carrying? And is it really worth it? And what if today could be the day where you begin to let that go and find freedom? Resentment don't do no good no way. But look what love can do. Look what love has done from a savior who extended his arms on the cross and cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. It is finished. I want to invite you into a space this morning if there's some work that God needs to do in you today. And I want to invite you to maybe think about a relationship in your life right now where there's a rift. And I'm wondering what it might look like for there to be healing and forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, let me give a pastor sidebar here. There are some occasions when reconciliation is not possible, nor would it be advisable if you've been in an abusive relationship or a relationship so toxic. So as we reflect on this, I would say before you make a move in a relationship that you're wondering if that's the healthiest thing, I would encourage you to talk to a counselor or a pastor first or someone you trust. But generally today, I want to invite you into that space to think, is there, is there a relationship that God is, is calling you today to be the one? Don't wait for the other person. You be the one today to take a step, to make a move, and know that he wants to give you the grace to do that. So let's pray. Lord, we take a moment now to be honest with ourselves, to be honest with you, like the psalmist to say, search our hearts and know them that if there is any offensive, evil way in us, God, shine your light there and bring healing to these tender places. Lord, we wait on you this morning. We want to listen to you. Oh God, we need you. Oh, how we need you. Every day, we need you. You are our righteousness. You are our one defense. You are the one who brings healing and freedom and forgiveness and reconciliation. We love you, Lord. And thank you for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and worship together.